Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about constellations, precession of the equinoxes, the magnitude system, and all sorts of observational phenomena. So, first of all, constellations. Some of these constellations that you see should look familiar. In fact, for many people, they will all look familiar because these are the constellations of the zodiac. Where do they come from? Why are they special? So that's another question that we're going to be addressing here. So constellations are groupings of stars that have a historical reference to some sort of mythological figure, animal, or object. Whereas an asterism, on the other hand, it's a small part of a constellation, or it might be part of parts of multiple constellations that has an interesting shape. Examples of constellations would be Ursa Major, Orion, Scorpius, Cepheus, Cassiopeia, etc. Examples of asterisms, on the other hand, would be the Big Dipper, the Summer Triangle, the Winter Hexagon, etc. So, stars and constellations, generally speaking, are not at the same distance from each other. Even though they might look relatively bright, but they are not at the same distance from us, I should say, um, even if they have relatively similar brightnesses. For example, in the case of the Big Dipper asterism of Ursa Major, you'll notice that um, it, it just so happens that several of the stars are relatively close together, but a couple of them are not. They just happen to be projected along the same line of sight. In other words, they're farther away, but they look of similar brightness because, in truth, they are actually brighter stars, just viewed from farther away. A, an exception to this rule is that a lot of the stars in the constellation Orion actually were born out of the same giant molecular cloud. But generally speaking, that's not going to be the case. Many cultures have created stories and figures in the sky. For example, Orion is seen as either a hunter or Osiris, the god of light, or a great man or a military commander, an animal trap, or a thief of mischief maker, or as a canoe, depending on the, the culture of the world. So when we think of these constellations as having particular uh, mythological resemblances, we are generally referring to Greco-Roman mythology. So that's something that should be kept in mind. Where did the constellations come from? Well, they've been mentioned since ancient times, um, certainly since before the um, Greeks and Romans peaked in their civilizations, and some of them even go farther back for, than that. For example, there, there were uh, Egyptian priests who had certain constellations. The Babylonians for a long time were given credit for a lot of these, these constellations and their origins and everything. Most of the constellations that we think of as being part of the Greco-Roman mythological constellations were introduced to Greece by Eudoxus, and he probably learned them from Egyptian priests. Now, Ptolemy, who we will discuss a lot more about later on in the next unit, published a full description of 48 constellations in his work Almagest, which is something that we will talk about in the next unit and a lot of our current constellations come from this work. But there are more constellations than that, so we're going to discuss that in just a minute. Now, as I mentioned before, Babylonians were believed for a long time to have given us a whole lot of the original so-called Greco-Roman constellations, but we now realize that many of them, especially some of the southern constellations, were well known in ancient Egyptian texts, in some cases going as far back as 3000 B.C., now, our official constellations, we now recognize, owe their origins to multiple ancient civilizations. In fact, a lot of the southern constellations come a lot more recently than that. So, here's a picture of the sculpture of the Titan Atlas with the world on its shoulders. Well, that world has a lot of the constellations on it. Now, in 1928, the International Astronomical Union, who I like to affectionately refer to as the Astronomy Police, they defined the boundaries of 88 constellations in the sky, and they delineated them using north-south um, declination lines and east, or sorry, north-south right ascension marks and east-west declination marks, and took a bunch of parts of those in order to draw boundaries around the constellations. So, of course, a lot of the ones in the northern sky still owe their origins to the Greco-Roman constellations. So, here you have the uh, mythological characters on this, but where are the stars in their actual constellations? That is defined. For example, Orion, you see that this 
is composed of just a bunch of um, lines of constant right ascension and declination, and then broken up into different parts and different right ascensions, different declinations, that sort of thing. So this allows people to answer the question, oh, what constellation is this really faint star right here? Is it in Orion or is it in Taurus? Nope, Taurus is over here, Orion is over here. That star is definitely in Orion. And there is the constellation Orion itself, or at least much of the constellation Orion. Now, the zodiac are the constellations that a lot of you might be very familiar with because they form the constellations that you look up in your horoscope and you were born in a particular month or at a particular time of year that corresponds to a certain constellation of the zodiac. Now, in truth, the zodiac is the set of constellations through which our sun travels over the course of a year. Now, the path that our sun appears to take through those constellations is called the ecliptic. So as Earth orbits around the sun, our sun appears to take a path relative to the background stars. That path is called the ecliptic. The set of constellations that the ecliptic passes through is called the zodiac. Now, in ancient times, these were the constellations that you're all familiar with from the zodiac and we would say okay if you were born in late December or sorry late November or early December you're a Sagittarius if you were born in late December or early January you're a Capricornus um, because our sun was in the constellation Capricorn when you were born but that's no longer the case um, due to the effects of precession which we're going to discuss relatively soon in this video in fact the new constellation, Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, has kind of crept into the zodiac. And a, a very, very tiny part of the constellation, Cetus, is also there. So these are kind of um, the constellations that are now in the zodiac at certain times of year. Normally you would think, okay, if I was born, say, in the middle of January, then I should be a Capricornus. Well, it turns out actually the sun was in Sagittarius when you were born because of the effects of that procession that we'll discuss soon. Now, what is this procession? Well, it has allowed Ophiuchus and a very tiny part of Cetus to creep in. So, and in truth, because of these effects, during the 2,000 years since this was kind of um, canonized by the ancient Greeks, constellation Ophiuchus has now come in between Scorpius and Sagittarius. So if you were born, say, in early December, there's a decent chance that you are actually an Ophiuchus. In fact, ironically, the sun is in Ophiuchus longer now than it is in Sagittarius, but that was not the case in ancient times. In fact, as I mentioned before, Cetus is, has crept in as well. In fact, if you were born like around April 2nd or April 3rd, you are technically um, a cetacean, so to speak. Um, it's ironic that that's really close to April Fool's Day. But this blue line, is, or this blue curve, is the ecliptic, and notice that it does just barely clip Cetus right there. So that's kind of cool. Now, how does this procession work? So if you've ever spun a toy top, you'll notice that as it starts to spin down, its axis of rotation moves around in um, a kind of over the edge of a cone. Well, that is called precession. That happens whenever you have a force on a spinning object that is not directly down the axis of rotation. Well, Earth is a spinning object. Earth orbits around the sun. Our axis is tilted, but first, it's not tilted at 90 degrees. Second, that axial tilt, even if it was tilted at 90 degrees, would not be able to always be pointed directly toward the sun. So as a result, Earth's axis exhibits precession as Earth revolves around the sun. The period of that precession is very long because of the fact that Earth is a very massive body. But also our sun does exert a large gravitational force, so the result is that this procession does happen. In fact, the period of the procession is about 26,000 years, 25,770 years to be more precise. So what does that mean for us? It means that yes, our axis stays tilted at about 23 degrees, but the direction of that tilt ends up 
undergoing a cyclical um, variation over the course of about 26,000 years. So that the direction that the North geographic pole is pointed changes over the course of time. In other words, where is the North Celestial Pole? That is the point on the celestial sphere that's directly above Earth's northern axis of rotation. Well, right now, that point is in this spot right here in the constellation Ursa Minor. Interestingly, that is very close to a relatively bright star called Polaris. We call it the North Star. In fact, it'll be even closer to Polaris in like 50 years or so, 50 or 100 years or so. And that, that will be the ideal time to use Polaris as the North Star. However, back in the year zero, there were no bright stars close to the North Celestial Pole. However, back in the year 3000 BC, the star Thuban in Draco was very close to the North Celestial Pole. In fact, that was the time when the uh, Great Pyramids started being built. Now, in the year 4000, we will be farther, far enough away again from Polaris that it would not be really all that sensible to call it the North Star. Instead, the star in Cepheus would be a better North Star at that time. And then, at around the year 10,000, that is about 8,000 years from now, the star Deneb in Cygnus will be reasonably somewhat close to the North Celestial Pole, that it will be kind of like a, um, a North Star. Kind of like a North Star. And then, around the year 14,000 AD, Vega will be reasonably close to where the North Celestial Pole will be. The North Celestial Pole, again, is going to be on this yellow circle. And then, finally, in the year 28,000 AD, the North Star will be back to being Polaris. Now notice that because of the fact that our North Celestial Pole is pointed toward a certain spot in the sky, the ecliptic, the path that our Sun appears to take with respect to the background stars, will go through certain constellations. However, in say 14,000 years, the North Celestial Pole will be pointed toward the constellation Lyra, or Lyra. Well, would that mean that the ecliptic would end up changing? Yes, it would, because that whole direction of that were pointed would mean that the set of constellations that our sun would appear to travel through over the course of the year will also end up getting tilted as well as as the uh, procession ends up proceeding as Earth's axis of rotation precesses around. Well, the ecliptic will also precess around as well. So that means that, yeah, at, at some points, at some times during this whole cycle, Orion will be in the well, the ecliptic will pass through Orion, and Orion will be a zodiac constellation. It's not the case right now, but it can happen. So, now would be a good time for you to pause the video and write down a summary of um, comparing and contrasting the words constellation, asterism, and zodiac. So now would be a good time to pause the video and do that, and also write about what is the ecliptic. So now, hopefully you have done this, and if there are people around you, maybe discuss and compare. If not, the answers that you should have are that a constellation is a pattern of stars that seems to outline some sort of mythological being, a creature, or maybe even a navigational instrument. Whereas an asterism is a set of stars that might be part of a constellation or part of multiple constellations that reminds us of a particular type of shape or figure. The zodiac, well, let's do the ecliptic first. The ecliptic is the path that our sun takes with respect to the background star over the stars over the course of a year, or at least the path it appears to take. And the zodiac is the set of constellations the ecliptic passes through. Now, how bright are the stars? How can we compare this, these brightnesses? That's where the magnitude system comes in. Now, we've mentioned it before. It's an anti-intuitive type of system in that as the numbers increase, the brightness actually decreases. Now, you might wonder, why would anybody ever do something like that? Why would anybody make it the opposite of what you would think? Well, there's a good reason for that. It's because in the original form that was invented by the ancient astronomer Hipparchus, he said, okay, the brightest stars that you can see in the night sky, we're going to call those stars of the first magnitude. These are first magnitude stars. These are the brightest ones. 
How about the next brightest stars after that? They're still pretty darn bright, and they're just not, they're clearly not as bright as the first magnitude stars. So he said, okay, we're going to call those second magnitude stars. What about the ones after that? Well, those will be third magnitude stars. Okay, fine, where do you stop? So it was agreed that you stop at the sixth magnitude. They, they said that sixth mag stars, quote, of the sixth magnitude were ones that you could just barely see um, in a clear sky on a dark night. Well, eventually we improved the system, and because of the fact that our eyes work logarithmically, in other words, something that is um, much brighter than something else, like, okay, something that might be, say, 10 times brighter than something else. Well, we would observe something else that's 10 times brighter than that to be as much brighter than that as the first thing was that uh, from the original. For example, if object B is 10 times as bright as object A and object C is 10 times as bright as object B, then we would say just from the way that our eyes and our brains interpret things, we would say that object C is as much brighter than object B as object B is compared with object A. So our eyes work logarithmically. So the magnitude system is made to work logarithmically. But as such, we need to make it numerical. So a star with a magnitude of 1 is brighter than a star of magnitude 2 by the same factor that a star of magnitude 2 is brighter than a star of magnitude 3. Now, the actual factor by which it's brighter is actually 2.512, which is approximately the fifth root of 100. The idea being is that we want a first magnitude star to be exactly 100 times brighter than a sixth magnitude star. That's the new definition of that system. So it's calibrated so that if you average over different a number of different wavelength bands, the star Vega has an apparent magnitude of 0, 0.00. So Vega is a pretty darn bright star, but it's not the brightest star in the night sky. Um, the star Sirius has an apparent magnitude of minus 1.47. Um, now, you might end up looking up Sirius on Wikipedia or something like that and say, oh, he, he got it wrong. It's not minus 1.47, it's minus 1.46 or minus 1.63 or something like that. It actually depends which wavelength band you're looking up. Different stars that have different temperatures are going to be a little bit brighter or dimmer than some other stars of similar magnitudes that might have different temperatures. And that's because, like, okay, um, the temperature of a star is what corresponds to the color that it appears. We're going to come back to that in a couple of units. Our sun, by the way, has an apparent magnitude of minus 26.74 on the same scale. What about some other objects? Well, at its very brightest, when it's, say, at um, the, its closest approach to Earth during a full moon, orbits are elliptical, not circular, so sometimes the moon's a little closer, sometimes it's a little farther away, but it's very, it's, at its very closest approach, the full moon can be close to magnitude minus 13. At its very brightest, Venus is around minus 4.9. Now, the dimmest objects that can be seen during full daylight are at minus 4.0. So yeah, Venus, having a lower number, meaning a being brighter, is bright enough to be seen during the daytime if you know exactly where to look. How do you know exactly where to look? Well, it's hard because the sky itself is bright and that is very distracting. But once you find Venus during the daytime, it's actually rather easy to see it. But if you glance away, if you don't know how to find it again, it's hard. Um, and that's just, be, again, because of the, the effect that the sky itself is relatively bright. The easiest way to find Venus during the daytime is to look for a time of year where Venus happens to be pretty close, or very close preferably, to a crescent moon that's also visible during the daytime. Look for the moon and then look for Venus. And this happens like a couple times a year. So um, I, I've done it during one, one of my classes before and people are able to see Venus during the daytime. Though once it gets close to the horizon, it can be kind of hard. But if you see it above the horizon, a good bit above the horizon. Yeah, it's definitely visible during the daytime. And when you see it, it's like, how have I always been missing this? But then when you glance away, you realize, oh, that's how. 
Jupiter at its brightest, it's close to minus three. Same with Mars when it's, when it's at its very brightest. Mars actually has the second most elliptical orbit of any of the planets, so there's a noticeable difference between um, local brightnesses of Mars. Right now, in fall of 2020, when I'm making this video right now, Mars is approaching opposition. We're going to see what that means relatively soon. But it's at about minus 2.4 right now as we speak uh, in the evening sky. Mercury at its brightest, brightest, it's pretty bright. It's just that Mercury, you know, it's the closest planet to the sun. It's always relatively close to the horizon when you can see it, which is why most, supposedly most professional astronomers have never seen the planet Mercury. And we already mentioned the star Sirius. What about some other objects? Well, Saturn, when it's at its, at its brightest, and Saturn is pretty bright right now. It's at about zero um, in fall 2020. It's, it can get as bright as about minus 0 0.5. The star Arcturus, which is the um, second brightest star that is visible from most mid-latitudes in the northern hemisphere, that's at about minus 0 0.04. And then there's Vega, about plus 0 0.03. Oh, wait a second. I thought Vega was supposed to be defined as 0 0.00. Yeah, but that's an average of different wavelength bands. Here we're talking about, I think, quote, visible magnitude. And then you have Rigel and Betelgeuse. The Betelgeuse, as you might know, is something of a variable star. It fluctuates in its brightnesses. Um, the Andromeda Galaxy, 3.44. Yeah, you can see the Andromeda Galaxy with your unaided eye. However, its brightness is spread out. Um, the star Alcor in Ursa Major is something like 3.9 or 4.1 or something like that. Believe me, um, in the light polluted skies of Northern Virginia, which is where I'm making this video right now, Alcor is much, much easier to see than the Andromeda Galaxy, even though the Andromeda Galaxy has a brighter apparent magnitude. That light is spread out over the disk of the galaxy. So that makes it a lot harder to see in the light polluted skies of Northern Virginia. Where I used to live in Charlottesville, the Andromeda Galaxy was actually rather easy to see if you knew where to look. Jupiter's moon Ganymede, 4.38. Oh, why can't I see Ganymede when I look at Jupiter? Because, Going back here, Jupiter is so darn bright that it blots out Ganymede. In fact, all of Jupiter's moon, uh, Galilean moons, its four biggest moons, are bright enough to be seen during the un with the unaided eye if you got rid of Jupiter. Planet Uranus, 5.3 to 5.9. So yeah, you can see Uranus with your unaided eye. Good nighttime vision under very dark skies, up to about 6.5. Neptune is beyond that. So generally, you're, you're not going to be able to see Neptune with your unaided eye. And Pluto, no chance. In fact, you need a telescope for that. Neptune binoculars will get you Neptune. So here's a scale. And remember, as you go to the left, you get brighter. As you go to the right on the number line, you get dimmer. So fainter objects have higher apparent magnitudes. Brighter objects have lower apparent magnitudes. Now, I keep using the term apparent magnitude. Why am I doing that? Well, because there's something called absolute magnitude. So um, maybe pause the video for a few seconds and try to remember the definition of a parsec. A parsec is the distance away from our solar system that an object would have to be such that as Earth traverses around the sun in its orbit, the object, like say a star, appears to move by one arc second over the course of a year, one arc second of angle, that is one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. So. That has to be pretty far. It turns out it's about three and a quarter light years. So here's the idea. How bright is the object actually? Does it, is it bright because it's really close, or is it bright because it actually truly is bright? Well, what do we mean by truly is bright? That's where absolute magnitude comes in. Absolute magnitude is a way to categorize stars by how bright they truly are. So here's the definition. A star's absolute magnitude is what its apparent magnitude would be when viewed at a distance of 10 parsecs, that is about 32.6 light years. So, well, what's our sun's absolute magnitude? Turns out that if you were to put our sun 10 parsecs away, its absolute magnitude would be 4.83. That's not very bright. So it would not be one of the brightest stars in the night sky at all, viewed from 10 parsecs away. However, if you brought Rigel, which actually is truly a very bright star, to 10 parsecs away, it would shine at magnitude minus 7. You would easily be able to see it during the daytime. Sirius has an absolute magnitude of 1.42. What that tells us is that Sirius is 
really bright in the night sky for two reasons. One, it actually is a somewhat bright star, but two, it's actually one of the closest stars to us. Deneb, the brightest star in Cygnus, is minus 8.38, but the brightest star overall is a star called R136A1. It has an absolute magnitude of minus 12 and a half. It would be as bright as the full moon if viewed from 10 parsecs away. It's the brightest star known. It's also the most massive star known at about 310 to 320 solar masses. That is 310 to 320 times the mass of our sun. So that star is actually in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's in a galaxy that orbits our galaxy. But that star's apparent magnitude over all wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum is actually something like plus six. It would be visible to the unaided eye, even though it's in a different galaxy, if it wasn't for the fact that the vast majority of its light is actually emitted in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. So its visible magnitude, and its visible apparent magnitude is dimmer than plus six. But still, it's an incredibly bright star. We'll have a lot more to say about stars like R136A1 when we talk about the stars unit, which will be later in the year. Planets. Um, it doesn't, so there's a different system for classifying absolute magnitudes with planets. It has to do with like how bright they would appear if they were one astronomical unit away from Earth um, at a certain point in their orbit, something like that. We don't need to get into that. But when is the best time to view a planet? So there are two types of planets. This is going to make some planets feel bad, but we have to do it anyway. There are planets called inferior planets, and there are planets called superior planets. Inferior planets are planets that orbit inside of Earth's orbit. Superior planets are planets that orbit outside of Earth's orbit. So Mars is a superior planet. Mercury and Venus are inferior planets. And of course, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are superior planets. Now, how can you tell if you don't already know what's out in the sky, whether you're looking at a star or a planet? Well, generally, a planet is not going to twinkle much to speak of. So Venus and Jupiter, by the way, are generally going to be brighter than any of the stars out there, so you don't need to worry about those. But what about Mars when it's not approaching its brightest, what we call opposition? What about Saturn? How can you tell whether those are stars or whether they're planets? So yeah, generally the planets don't twinkle so much. The reason for this is because the planets actually have a visible disk when you look at them in a telescope. And why do stars twinkle? Well, stars twinkle because their light is passing through certain little turbulent eddies of air. And those turbulent eddies have, say, slightly different temperatures and um, little bit, bits of motion. And those combinations cause um, different uh, wavelengths of the light from the star to get refracted at slightly different angles. And that happens very quickly. And as that happens, you can kind of see the star kind of go through different colors in, of the rainbow. And as that happens, it, it appears that the star is twinkling. Um, sometimes these colors, these different colors can be easily visible if you look at stars like Sirius when they're close to the horizon on a very turbulent night. It's actually a really cool effect. However, planets have a large enough disk that the actual angular size of the disk, even though we can't see it with our unaided eyes, the angular size of the disk is typically on the same size scale or bigger in angular size than the, the angular size of these turbulent eddies. So as a result, the planet's light doesn't get refracted so much, or at least when it does, it gets canceled out by different parts across those eddies. So the planets generally don't appear to twinkle as much. I have seen Mercury twinkle. Mercury does twinkle a little bit, but not as much as the star Arcturus, which is sometimes relatively close to Mercury at times when I'm able to see Mercury. Now, opposition. I've mentioned the term opposition before. Opposition occurs when a superior planet, that is a planet that's out, orbits outside of Earth's orbit, when a superior planet is on the opposite, opposition, side of Earth from the Sun. What does that mean? It means that, first of all, we can see the full disk of the planet lit up. Second of all, that light is reflecting back to us directly. Third of all, it's when the planet, more often than not, is at its closest point to us in its orbit. 
So those factors combined make viewing a planet at opposition a particular treat, especially Mars, because, you know, Mars's orbit is just outside of Earth's orbit, which means that there are times when Mars is relatively far from Earth, like it can be almost two astronomical units away from Earth. At that time, Mars is not all that bright. It'll have an apparent magnitude of like plus two. However, when Mars is at opposition, its apparent magnitude can be as low as minus 2.9. So that it can be incredibly bright at times when it's at opposition. And during those times at opposition, that it can be really neat to look at Mars. During Mars's opposition of 2016, that was a particularly bright opposition. I think it peaked at about minus 2.6 or minus 2.7. It really shone a nice deep orange red in the sky. In 2018, it also had a really nice opposition. However, that was a difficult opposition to observe because 2018 um, was one of the rainiest years on record. Um, in Northern Virginia, we generally had over 60 inches of rain that year, um, depending on where you were. So that was, it made it so that there weren't very many good opportunities to see it, especially when it was actually at opposition during the summer, which is when we were having a whole bunch of that rain. So again, these terms, inferior and superior planets, only superior planets can be seen at opposition because they're the only ones that can be on the opposite side of Earth. But yeah, they don't um, mean that the planet is, one planet is inherently better than some other planet. We're not uh, planetocysts or anything like that. So, but yeah, when planets are at opposition, those tend to be the best times to see planets. So you should definitely know that term because it's a very important term for night sky viewing. Now, inferior planets don't have opposition. Instead, the best times to view inferior planets are when they are closest to um, greatest elongation. Greatest elongation is when the planet and Earth and the Sun make a 90 degree angle. And when a planet is relatively close to greatest elongation, it's, that's going to, those are going to be times when it's going to have some of its best visibility. And that's because that's the time when the angle that we see the planet away from the sun is at its greatest. It's never going to be 90 degrees or anything like that, otherwise it would share Earth's orbit, but it's going to be at its greatest near um, greatest elongation. So one, that's going to be a time when it's far, farthest in angle from the sun, so you're going to be able to see it um, deep into the evening or early in the morning before the sun comes up. Not too early. I mean, Mercury never gets all that far from the sun. But And also, enough of the planet's disk is lit up that you're actually able to uh, see a reasonable amount of the planet. So it's kind of a balance, a balance between when you have a decent amount of the disk lit up and uh, when the planet has a large angle away from, away from the sun that we can see it at its best viewing. However, when the planet's between Earth and the Sun, what we call inferior conjunction, uh, hardly any of the disk is going to be lit at all. In fact, there are specific times called transits when the planet actually happens to cross the disk of the Sun. Those are, those are nice viewing times for different reasons, because you can actually see this little circle crossing the disk of the Sun. On the other hand, there is something called superior conjunction, when the full disk of the planet is lit up, but you're only going to be able to see it during the daytime. So that's generally not going to be a good time to try to observe the planet. And you might think, oh, wait a second, I thought we could see Venus during the daytime. Yeah, but when it's at superior conjunction, it's going to be right around the sun's disk. Not a good idea, especially with a telescope. So you don't really need to understand the difference between greatest eastern elongation, which is when the planet is farthest east from the sun, and greatest western elongation when it is farthest west from the sun. But just understanding that the inferior planets are best viewed near greatest elongation is a good idea. So, yeah, as I mentioned, that's when the planets are going to be relatively bright and farthest in angle from the sun. So it's a good idea to at least understand the concept of greatest elongation. The other terms like superior conjunction, quadrature, inferior conjunction, etc., are terms that you really don't need to know. So that is the end of our discussion of constellations and other night sky phenomena, um, at least having to do with the stars and the planets. 
in our next set of videos, we're going to get into discussing seasons and timekeeping. So hopefully I'll see you all then, and thank you for watching.